Uh, thank you very much. I just have a couple of introductory slides. I'll really go very fast through them. I'll slow down when I get further, but they're just meant to create in the context of what I'm talking about. Um, so the important thing on this slide is actually what I'm going to say in the next half hour is about academic publications. So it's about articles, it's scholarly journals, and it's about monographs with scholarly publishers. And the importance of that is why uh, we only talk about academic publications is it changes the, um, what the authors want in this. I fully understand that when it's a musician talking, a photographer talking, a novelist, a poet, they want to they earn on the sales of their work in order to have an income. It's very different with academics. Academics earn a wage, so they're not supposed to earn money on what they publish. And it changes the system. In theory, this should mean that an academic publication can be a lot cheaper than a creative work. Well, actually, it's the other way around. So somebody is making serious money on this. Why should we care about open access to academic publications? Basically, there are ethical reasons, there are academic reasons, and there are financial reasons. And really differs the discussion, really differs who you're talking to. Funders and governments will care about the ethical reasons. Academics obviously will mostly think about the academic reasons. And people like me working in libraries or working in administrations of universities and research institutes will think of the financial reasons to do open access. So what are the ethical reasons? The search of scholarly research should be available to the general public. I think we all agree on that. And it should be available to scholars all over the world. So it should not be able to make a difference whether you're a researcher at Harvard or at some African university. It's very unfair that the researcher at Harvard has access to a lot more academic publications than a researcher at an African university. Academic interest is clearly better for scholarship. It's better for the scholar. There's an increase, a proven increase in visibility and use. Uh, positive effect on our metrics. And actually, even for academics who don't particularly care about all of that, they're going to be more and more forced to do so, because otherwise they don't get any funding if they don't do open access for their publications. But then the financial reasons is obviously the cost for academic publishing. I have no way of, uh, I could not check these figures, but uh, on the right there you see a picture of a presentation at the fall of 2017 that they are uh, stating that one third of the total research budget, the global research budget, is spent on the dissemination of research results. And only 1% of the world population has access to that. If those figures are right, then maybe they're only if they're a little bit off, we have a very big problem. And the focus when we talk about uh, the financial reasons, the cost of academic publishing, tends to be in subscription costs, the so-called serious crisis. Of course, in the fields where the monographs are still very important too, it's also a problem because if the rise of subscriptions arise, there's no more money to buy any books. Just two slides uh, to show this is probably something uh, draft uh, some of you are familiar with. And then there was a presentation at the Parliament to just indicate how much the uh, expenditure on subscriptions for academic journals uh, compares to the cost of living. Cost of living between 18, 1986 and 2010 more or less doubled. But the cost of academic journals has quadrupled in the same amount of time. And it hasn't stopped in 2010. It goes on until now. And just to make clear that this is not only a problem in England, uh, just the example of the uh, library used to run, the part of the library I used to run is the blue line is the line of the budget that the Faculty of Arts gave to the library in order to buy books and journals. The red line is the cost of the subscriptions of the journals itself. And as you see, 2010, 2011, 2012, it was a massive problem because, so to speak, you got 200,000 euros the 1st of January and the 2nd of January you had to buy 200, or you had to pay 230,000 euros for subscriptions especially for an arts faculty library where most people think it's all about the books, the journals, we don't really care about the journals. That is a massive problem. Uh, but so how do we do it? And that's what I'm going to slow down in the rest of the presentation. There's basically three ways of achieving this. There's green open access, there's for profit gold open access, and there's non-profit gold open access. Green open access, as I will argue, for me, that's the old paradigm because it's a solution for some, but not for all of the problems. So what this green open access is basically the author him or herself deposits a version in a digital archive called an institutional repository. 
that is very rarely the only published version. It's an alternative version next to the commercial. And quite often the green open access version is inferior to the commercial. You're only allowed to archive your preprint, so before pre-review, or your post-print, the pre-reviewed version, but before the layout. And quite often there's an embargo, meaning that, for instance, I can publish an article in January 2018, but my archived version is only allowed to become available to the public in January 2019. So for the categories to open access, green open access provides a solution. It's perfectly fine just to, sometimes a little bit later, some are a little bit less nicely looking, but you have access to the research results for the general audience. Academic reasons to do open access. Green open access does not really provide a solution, only a possible solution in certain fields. Uh, for instance, I'm a humanities scholar. I do not want people to have access to sort of a draft of what I publish. I want people to have access to the finished product. Um, and so in most fields, it has not proven to be a challenge for the traditional publication model. And financial reasons for open access, green open access does not provide a solution. If you have to run an institutional repository, that's going to cost money. You need the infrastructure and you need people to work on the repository. So it costs more. You're putting more money into the system. There were high hopes for this system. For instance, Stephen Harnett is a very known advocate for green open access. He talked about the inevitable success of transitional green open access. He was dreaming of a world there was going to be no embargo green open access. It's going to be universally mandated and provided. This will be a natural transition to fair gold open access. What that means, I will talk, uh, I will say in the last couple of slides. Um, and so basically he thought it's only going to be peer review that the publishers will do. We will have to pay for this, but that's going to cost us a lot less money than our subscription costs. So there's a very clear criticism on green open access, for instance, by Michael Eason. He speaks about the inevitable failure of parasitic green open access. He says there's a fundamental logical flaw with this. Subscription publishers only give their blessing to green open access as long as they don't see it as a threat. The minute it starts becoming a threat for commercial publishing, they're going to come down on it. And the proof of that is that subscription publishers limit auto self-archiving much more than they used to do because it becomes much more of a problem for them. In any case, whether you're for or against green open access, it's very clear that the high hopes have not been fulfilled, that it's no game changer, and that in most cases it's just an alternative next to the traditional publication. Then you have for profit gold open access, the second one. And my point is that the open access mandates from funders of governments risk making this the new paradigm and that it is extremely costly if it is not managed well. So what this for-profit gold open access is the author immediately publishes in open access. So the gold open access version is the final version. There's absolutely no reason to distribute any inferior versions anymore. Um, and it typically works, not always, but it can work with APCs, BPCs, article processing charges, uh, book processing charges, which basically means that it's the author that pays for the production rather than the reader that pays after the fact. The reader who used to buy a book or used to uh, buy a subscription, now it's for free for the reader, or can be for free for the reader, but it's the person publishing that pays for the fact that something is produced. And there's two ways of doing for profit gold up next. Gold hybrid is actually paying a fee, the author pays a fee to make an article open access in a subscription based journal or to make a chapter open access in a commercial book. And that is called double dipping, because of course the publisher is twice passing uh, at, the, at the top. He makes the author, the producer pay, and he makes the reader pay. It's very clear that a lot of studies have shown, and like uh, governments have started to realize this, this is not a working or viable way towards an open access world. Uh, and so, Commercial publishers will say, yeah, but this is a transitional model. You cannot expect from us to one day after the other change our subscription-based journals to open access journals based on APCs. You need to give us some time. And in order to give us this time, you need to fund the transitional model. Well, I would definitely say don't believe everything you hear they tell you. And I will show in the next slide why. Um, the other model is, OK, no gold hybrid. It's purely based on APCs and BPCs, namely the order pays for. 
So my point is that academics are driven to that by open access mandates at great cost. And the prime example of this is what happened in the UK after the spectacularly bad Finch report. Those are not my words, but the words of Gavi Ali Baya was there in the uh, references. So there was a clear, what is the Finch report? It was a report in 2012 in England that really said, okay, we need to have a change of policy. We're going to go for open access or hybrid journals, which need to be funded by APCs. And the green open access is fine, but only if the embargo period is less than six months in the STEM disciplines, less than 12 months in humanities, arts, and social sciences. If not, the government, B, or the Research Council of the UK, will pay to have gold open access immediately. Sounds very good at first. But of course, what happened, there's been reports five years later, there's more gold hybrid in the UK than anywhere else in the world. 80% of the money put into the system goes to the gold hybrid. It is not used to flip. That's what the, the, the uh, commercial publishers said. We need, need this to be able to flip our model. They're not doing it at all. They're just very happy to get, be able to get paid both ways, by the author and by the libraries or by the uh, individual users. Um, and it's very clear that publishers have adapted their policies to maximize the ability of getting more money. For instance, there was, remember the Finch report said, six months of embargo is fine. If it's more, we will be able to pay for this. What do the big players like Elsevier and Miley do? They did not have embargo. And they said, okay, now all of a sudden we introduce an embargo of seven months. So you will have to pay to, in order to get the, no embargo. Um, so it's very clear the centrally managed APC expenditure has, in the two years that they had statistics for, is by 555%. So there's more than 8 million pounds going per year going into the system more than it used to be. Um, and the largest number of payments are made to, surprise, surprise, commercial publishers. With Elsevier and Wiley, which are two traditional subscription-based publishers, taking 40% of the total APC spent. Uh, and it's very bad for university libraries, who just act as a middleman for transferring government months, funds to commercial publishers. We do that in a subscription model too, but nowadays we spend very, we even transfer more money than we used to do, and it, it comes at a lot bigger administration cost than we had before with the subscription model. So any deal that hybrid that stimulates hybrid gold open access is, I think. No good, and I think most people now realize that. So maybe what we should do is just offset APCs against subscription costs. So basically, that is what you pay, new institution pays, uh, of uh, researchers affiliated to that institute pay for their publishing, is then uh, subtracted from what that institution pays in subscriptions. Those can be good, but only if, and those are big ifs, if it's transitional, if it's transformative, if it does not come at, as if it comes at the same cost or cheaper than a subscription deal, if it does not come at the expense of disciplines where the big publishers currently have a very limited market share, and if it does not come at the expense of non-profit called open access initiatives. And in order to get a deal like that, it's extremely difficult to get a deal like that. You can only get a deal like that if you enter negotiations with the big publishers completely prepared, meaning you need to have an extensive and detailed analysis of fabrication and uses data, and failure, so having no deal with those publishers, must be an option. If you start a negotiation and say, well, look, I, at the end of the day, I will need to make a deal with you, you're lost. Don't start negotiations. You need to be able to say, I can walk out of the room without a deal. Uh, and so remember, offsetting deals are complex and even and difficult to manage. Don't believe me, it's Danny Kingsley who said that, who has a couple of years of experience having these deals. Um, and they hold the risk of strengthening the oligopoly in the fields where there already is one, and threatens to introduce one where there's none. What I mean by that is, imagine that you have a deal with Elsevier, which means that for a researcher at your university, it's for free to publish with Elsevier. But you don't have that deal with another smaller publisher which means that that person still would have to pay to publish with that other person. What will the researcher do? He will, of course, go to Elsevier, because for him, it's for free to go to Elsevier. And he will still have to pay to go with another publisher who maybe is ethically much more better. Um, and it's extremely difficult to get a good deal like that. So you only stand a chance if you let your best and brightest spend a lot of time on this. 
And that is something that I really struggle with. Do we really want to have the best and brightest in the university libraries to spend all of their time and energy on doing that? Maybe we should let them build on the alternatives rather than trying to make the best of a bad system. Uh, and every victory risks being a short-term victory. Imagine you have a fantastic deal with Elsevier in 2018. What will Elsevier say in 2020 when you enter negotiations again? They will say, hey, look, you had a fantastic deal in 2018. You will not be able to do the same again. Now you will have to start paying the same. There's a big fear too in the library community if they, they're now negotiating in Germany, that if they manage to get a good deal in Germany, what will Elsevier do? Okay, let's um, try to make up for what we lost in Germany by making a better deal with Belgium, with the Netherlands, with France. With, so it's very difficult to get a good deal with this. The essence basically is do not believe that a for-profit market for academic publishing, if it is funded by ABCs, BBCs, would be any better on the financial side than a for-profit market funded by subscription costs. And we have reason to look like, yeah, at the open access publishers with an, with an APC. The average APC grew by about 5% a year over the last two years. So it's exactly the same with our subscriptions. So ethical reasons for open access. Yes, for-profit guild open access provides a solution, possibly at a great cost. Academic reasons for open access. Yes, for-profit guild open access provides a solution, but again, possibly at a very great cost. Financial reasons for open access. Unregulated for-profit gold open access will not provide a solution, and quite the opposite. And so the conclusion so far, I don't know, probably people will say, well, that's why, that's why my presentation was titled and I like that. The traditional publication model, despite the rising costs, seems just better than non-regulated for-profit gold open access. And you can add green open access, but it needs to remain unthreatening unless you have a very strong international open access mandate for non embargo green open access. So for-profit gold open access is fool's gold open access if you're not careful. And it's a terrible idea if it's not done, done right. So no more, that's what I, I'm actually very happy uh, that in Belgium it's not yet forced upon our researchers. I don't believe in open access mandates if there's no embargo green open access and provisions and then there's extra funding for for-profit APC and BPC fund. Luckily, I don't have to start there. Stop there. There is an alternative. There is non-profit gold open access. And my idea is, my hope is that we can make this a new paradigm because it works cost-effective. And basically, you have three possibilities in this. First one is the illegal one, just the illegal distribution of scholarly publications. A lot of you have heard of SciHub which is the first private website in the world to provide mass and public interest to tens of millions of research papers. And it's willful copyright infringement. Uh, and it just provides access to scholarly literature to over 90% sometimes, and sometimes sometimes over 90% of coverage. There are um, examples of researchers at good universities which have access to a lot of journals, to a lot of monographs, who still use SciHub because it's a lot easier to use and they have more coverage than the 70% for their institution, they have 90% in sci -hub. So they use just the illegal alternative. Um, if anything, it's a sign that the subscription model is not working anymore. Things like this are so successful. Um, second option is completely legal, but actually a lot more radical. It's just to abandon the academic publishing as we know it. Why do we still try to do this, uh, share publications, work with journals, work with books? This is not 21st century scholarship anymore. Why don't we abandon this bad, not working system at all and just think of something completely different? Why don't we all use fiction there instead of doing publi publishing the way we used to, we know it? Um, and actually, there's a very interesting talk of Herbert von der Sompel, who's just on YouTube. I think it was the same just shortly before Christmas last year. His idea is research reports, which is contributor center instead of document centric. And he can explain it a lot better than I can do, but it's a very interesting idea. And, but it basically means abandoning publishing as we know it. Not less radical, um, but also legal, is to go for fair gold open access, which is basically the same as what I said with gold open access, author immediately publishing open access. It is the final version. No reason to distribute inferior versions. 
but it works with cost-effective APCs, BPCs, or there's a third party who pays for the cost of publishing, the real cost of publishing. And so just a set of strict conditions prevent the commercial exploitation of the publication of research results. Basically it means that title needs to be owned by the author, editorial board, or by the learned society. CC by license applies. All articles or books need to be published and follow open access, so clearly no consumer costs, no subscriptions, no double dipping. Um, and the publication costs, publishing costs need to be low, transparent, in proportion to the value added by the publisher. So basically it works like that. On the left is the traditional model, on the right a fair open access model. It just moves copyright and journal authorship no longer with the publishers, but with the researchers. And libraries do the editorial assistance, the workflow, the help desk, the storage. No longer have subscription, no longer pay subscription costs, but basically pay either APCs or pay for the cost of the infrastructure. Uh, and it just like yeah, reducing publishers to basically service providers. Yeah. The idea behind this, why would all free green gold open access be fool's gold open access? Why would we wait for the commercial publishers? Who would of course be fools if I would work for a commercial publisher, I would not do this. I would of course not collaborate with this. I would defend my system, so why wait for them? Let's just do something else. And may I see, see a very strong role in this for university presses and even academic libraries. Academic libraries who have always been in charge of sort of bringing what happened in the research that happened all over the world, bringing it on campus. Why should I not play a central role in doing the other way around? Collecting the research that is done on campus and bringing it to the world. Yeah. And why would it actually be cheaper? That's a very valid question. Why would it be cheaper to produce a fair open access publication? Because you have exactly the same attention to quality control. Same efforts in doing peer review, same efforts in having professional layout, professional archiving, professional distribution, but the intention is not to make profit as much as possible, but just to work cost effectively. And you can save money on subscription management, digital rights management, legal fees for licensing, marketing. You can get rid of all of that. So ethical reasons for open access, non-profit gold open access provides a solution. Academic reasons, non-profit gold open access provides a solution. Financial reasons, non-profit gold open access provides a solution. And just to make clear that this is not just words. We truly try to practice what we preach. Um, at the University of Leuven, officially until 2018, there was an investment in green open access. So both to the infrastructure, there was an institutional repository and staff working on the repository. There was a very, very, very moderate support for fair gold open access. We just did the Open Library of Humanities, which is $1,555 a year. So that is nothing. Uh, and there was no support officially, no support for for-profit gold open access. In reality, there was a yearly spend outside of the library system, estimated between 375,000 euros and 500,000 euros, which is on top of the collection budget of the library, which is 8 million, and on top of other costs for academic publishing, which we have no idea about how much we actually are spending. These are just researchers using the money of their research groups or of their departments to publish, and we don't know about it. So what we decided to do starting in 2018 is strengthening our support for fair gold open access by not the, the system that uses APC and BBC, but that works without APCs, BBCs. So we continue our support for Open Library of Humanities. We have expanded to also do Language Science Press. We do Scope 3, for instance, too. And we have a fund for fair open access since March 2018, so it's very new, uh, which pays for BBCs for fair gold open access uh, monographs published by our university press. Uh, which pays for APCs uh, for articles and fair gold open access journals, regardless of the publishers. The BBC is about 6,500, representing the real cost of publishing, and so the scientific value is guaranteed for both fields. It was very important to le divide the support for open access with valuing the academic uh, value. Uh, so the assessment for open access support is completely separate from the pre review assessment of the manuscript. That is actually not only open to people affiliated with the university. If you have a, a university affiliation with Kyle Leuven, you're supposed to pay one third out of your own means and two thirds you get funded. If you have no affiliation with Kyle Leuven, you still can apply for support from the fund, which is one third, and two thirds you need to pay out of your own means. APCs also need to be based on real public 
publishing costs. Typically, they should be less than a thousand euros. Uh, publication and full open access is, of course, a, a prerequisite. Copyright should remain with the author. And again, the scientific value needs to be guaranteed to be worked with a combination of the directory of open access journals with either Web of Science or the VRBB, so that we also have the humanities and social sciences. That, unfortunately, is only open for authors uh, from the university, from Cardiff. And that was it, so if there's any questions, don't hesitate to ask them now or to just make the same email. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this uh, deep dive into open access. Any questions? So, to me, how do you, do you review and work the, the, the fact that um, sometimes we get a stamp of like publishing in a, in a famous journal in a, in a famous, that has its peer review, that has its value of mm. the, 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 the fact how, how that work? Well, the thing that indeed we, that was something that we thought about because, of course, we now have researchers at the Leuven who say, fantastic, all of a sudden there's now support to me for me to publish uh, in journals. And we have to say, yeah, 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 but only these kind of journals, only our whitelist publishers. Um, so it's, it's not a solution for them. It's, it's to try and steer them towards fair open access. It's not a solution for because, but then we always have this discussion then to explain to them, yeah, but if we would do that, we would end up in the British system. Uh, if we just pay whatever, just because it's a good uh, peer-reviewed journal with, with high impact factor, then we will not pay five, that we have to pay 5,000 euros per APC, we will not do that. So it's only part, it's just a try, uh, our way of trying to stimulate that side of the market. It is not a complete solution for the problem of the cost of academic publishing. Uh, and it's also, I hope there's a lot more humanities people here than STEM people here. It's also our way of making sure, I actually strongly believe, uh, I've come to the conclusion that in the STEM markets where indeed the commercial publishers have basically all the important journals, all the journals with high impact factors, it's going to be extremely difficult to change the market. There I see a lot more, and the only solution as I see it is abandon academic publishing as we know it. Uh, while in the humanities, where the, these big commercial publishers do only have a limited share of the market, our intention should be let's drive them outside the market. And it's mostly working for that. It's more, this, by the way, it goes for plus too. Like, yeah, quite often they feel like uh, plus is a bit more than a thousand, but it can be argued why it's a bit more than that. We will fund uh, plus publications too. Uh, but indeed, with the commercial publishers with high impact factors, it's not a solution. The only solution there, I don't think the solution lies within libraries, the solution lies with committees judging over like promotion committees and stuff like that. They need to abandon the general impact factor in their decision about researchers. Uh, and we will not be able to solve this from the library. Yeah. Any other questions or insights? Not really a question. Uh, it's then you know that. Uh, European Commission is looking at uh, a platform, a publishing platform, so that um, projects uh, funded by the European Commission can publish their publication in such a platform. And of course, we know the, it's not the same as publishing in a high end, uh, a high impact factor journal. Uh, but what do you think about this revolution? Welcome to us to it too. I think it's if it's done right, if they then don't go for like a commercial partner to build up platform and everything like that, I think it's perfectly okay. I, 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 it will have exactly the same problem, I think. It will not offer the same prestige as some researchers are looking for. Uh, and then it, there will be a limited uptake of it. Uh, and we have to be really careful. That's, I'm, I'm a section editor for the Open Library of Humanities. We are actually extremely, and probably a lot more than a commercial publishers, aware of it needs to be quality that we allow, because it's very hard to get rid of the, uh, like, uh, this is only good for second-rate research. Uh, and I do, I, I like, actually think I'm correct in saying this, our preview is a lot more rigorous than what we see in any commercial journal, uh, because we really want to make sure that we do not get a bad reputation. Uh, they will struggle the first couple of years, 
But I do think that Glossa is the example of being able to show it. So you had commercial journal leaving uh, Elsevier, going to the Opel, we are going to ubiquity press. Uh, for the first two, three years, they need to take that hit of losing their impact factor. But it's like, yeah, it takes them two, three years to again become the, and they made such a public display about it that it's very clear now we're dealing with people who publish for prestige. It's bad for your prestige to publish with Lingard, the old Elsevier journal. It's good for your prestige to publish with a good gloss of one, with a, with a ubiquitous. We need to do that, invest in that a lot more and give basically journals with the big publishers a bad name. That's the only way it's going to work, I think, too. We need to abandon the high impact factors and we need to work on, it needs to be editorial birds of researchers who are willing to leave. The, the quality of an academic journal does not depend on the publisher. It depends on the editorial board. If the editorial board completely leaves, that's when the value of the journal leaves too. Uh, and I think we should do more from libraries too to make sure that researchers understand this. Uh, again, that's why I'm a little bit pessimistic about when we talk about medicine or stuff like that, because the publishers indeed are then very good in, in making sure that they tie the researchers to themselves. I've never earned any money writing a review of being in an editorial board, being in the humanities. So. For me, it's not a problem to leave my commercial publishers. I never earned extra money doing it anyway, so I can as well do it in an ethical way. Yeah. Final short question? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.